Hey there, it's Teddy coming to you from down in my record room with yet another vinyl orgy. And uh, invited once again to this orgy are uh, members from The Big Dig, uh, continuing on shopping in my own record store. Who knew? It's been awesome. So let's get to it. Well, first up is an album from a consummate jazz artist that I have tremendous respect for, and that's the soprano saxophonist Steve Lacey. This is actually his second release as a leader called Reflections. Uh, It came out in 1959 on the new jazz label. This is actually an early 80s uh, OJC reissue, which uh, I want to give a big thumbs up for uh, these OJC uh, pieces because they uh, they sound great and uh, in many cases they're just easier to obtain uh, than an original so uh, yeah don't hesitate if you uh, come across an OJC uh, it's good stuff anyway um, Steve Lacey here in 1959 is in the process of bringing uh, the soprano sax out of the shadows of jazz history and uh, into the modern world and uh, he actually predates um, John Coltrane and uh, bringing uh, the soprano sax in, into uh, his musical arsenal. Um, he's also uh, probably the, the greatest um, admirer and interpreter of the music of Thelonious Monk. And that's what this album is, and it's the first album ever released uh, by another artist doing Monk's work. Everything up to this point had only been recorded by Monk himself. And, and wow, it's a beauty, um, and it has an incredible group with it, too. Uh, pianist, uh, it's first evidence of uh, working with the great Mal Waldron, who uh, is a subject all unto himself, but... Lacey and Waldron had uh, an, an ongoing relationship all the way through that was just wonderful. Bass player is Buell Neidlinger, interesting guy uh, who uh, had played with Cecil Taylor previously to this, uh, went on to uh, be uh, a, a symphonic bass player, also played with Frank Zappa, so uh, very skilled in a lot of uh, musical directions. And the drummer... Uh, is uh, the great Elvin Jones. So being 1959, this just predates him joining John Coltrane and uh, the run that those guys had together. So amazing group. And uh, what's really cool about this album is that uh, it features uh, compositions of Thelonious Monks that were lesser known and uh, in many ways more complex as well and wow uh lacy just charts a course through uh, uh monks you know compositional choppy waters uh and, and comes out as if they're his own i mean just wonderful so let's take a second and uh listen to just a bit of uh this album reflections <laughs> Yeah, very, very cool indeed. I mean, if you dig Thelonious Monk's music, then for me, this is an essential. Um, It's just uh, that good and uh, worthy of inclusion in uh, anyone's collection. So, Reflections from Steve Lacey, uh, originally released in 1959 and reissued here in the early 80s. On the OJC label. 
Well, I long to be far from the man and in crowd Then I yearn to be free of this social go round well, next up is uh, the proverbial diamond in the rough, and that's a 1975 release by Ronnie Lane, called Ronnie Lane's Slim Chance. Originally uh, released on Island Records, this is the U.S. pressing on A&M. Uh, Ronnie Lane was one of the founding members of uh, the Small Faces, later to be known as Faces, and uh, was uh, one of the primary uh, leaders of uh, both groups as a songwriter, bass player, uh, and singer. But by the uh, the early 70s, um, Faces uh, were kind of like uh, Rolling Stones' kid brother. They were they were rocking it pretty hard, and and uh, Lane had uh, kind of had enough of that lifestyle, and um, he split uh, to go out on his own and. Uh, he couldn't have gone in a more divergent direction than uh, from uh, the faces in <laughs> in the, the early '70s. He uh, he took off uh, and uh, lived on a farm in Wales, uh, away from the city, and uh, brought along a band of musicians, uh, and they uh, dove into a, a very uh, eclectic mix of acoustic music um, in this sort of gypsy-esque uh, atmosphere that uh, Lane created on this farm. But they they dove into a variety of, of music, you know, rock and roll, folk, country, vaudeville. Uh, I mean, it's sort of like you name it. Um, originals and some really cool covers as well which are, are on this album but uh i mean honestly um ronnie lane slim chance i mean what a great name too because he 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 pretty much knew at that point uh what his commercial potential was and named the group that and and it's just a beautiful thing i mean they're like uh as if uh as if early Fairport Convention uh, got drunk with the band and uh, the and screwed while listening to the Rolling Stones' uh, "Sweet Virginia," if that gives you some context for uh, what these guys were like. Well, let me give you some further context and let's let's listen to a little bit more of Ronnie Lane's Slim Chance. Well, once I was a stone, many years ago. Into a pool I strolled Many years ago Time passed by The pool ran dry Excavator was I And tempered to me In a fiery heat By the hand of a man Whose name was Dan Dan the blacksmith Yeah, um, I also want to put a link down below To uh, a really great documentary About Ronnie Lane uh, called The Passing Show uh, that the BBC did. Uh, and it's right here on YouTube. And uh, I urge you to check it out because uh, it's a really cool story uh, about, you know, the full, the full, uh, the full arc of uh, Ronnie Lane's uh, life and career. So, yeah, but uh, a very, very cool album uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, very ahead of its time for 1975 and uh, if you bump into it I would check it out for sure. Uh, 1975 Ronnie Lane's Slim Chance uh, both on Island and A&M Records. Well, let's take a little journey into Unique Land uh, with this 1981 ECM release uh, from Meredith Monk called Dolman Music. Uh, Meredith Monk is an American composer, uh, singer, choreographer, performance artist. I mean, she's a Renaissance woman, really. Uh, and her music is truly unique, and if given a chance, 
Um, it can tap into some uh, very raw, basic human emotions. I mean, it's a music that is centered around the, uh, the very elastic, uh, experimental possibilities in vocalizing. Uh, in a lot of cases, wordless vocals, um, both solo and uh, in group settings. Um, Meredith Monk um, is loosely connected to the uh, New York uh, minimalism scene, but what I mean, there's some repetitiveness, you know, in in her work. But what separates her from people like uh, Philip Glass or Steve Reich is this uh, heavy emotional content that comes through, and oftentimes it has kind of a very sort of ancient folk vibe to it. Um, very, very interesting. So on this album, uh, it's a gatefold. Uh, side one it are all uh, uh, solo pieces. Uh, there's minimal accompaniment, uh, either a uh, monk playing piano or uh, some uh, minimal percussion from Colin Walcott. Uh, and there's a wide range uh, of emotion from deep sorrow to uh, childlike elation uh, and all expressed uh, through these uh, vocal gymnastics that uh, she has available to her. Um, the second side is the title cut. Um, it's a six-part suite dolmen music that is uh, made for uh, six performers six vocalists, uh, uh, three female, three male, with some cello accompaniment. So uh, let's step back for just a second and uh, check out a little bit of the title cut, Dolman Music, so you can get a more of a flavor. <laughs> Yeah, unique indeed. Uh, Co-produced by uh, ECM's main man, Manfred Eicher, and the great Colin Walcott. And, you know, they just got out of the way uh, and supported where it needed support and let Meredith Monk do her thing. It's uh, recorded well. Of course, it's ECM, so it's sonically up to snuff, so... Again, uh, just truly unique. Uh, Meredith Monk. Dolman Music from 1981 on the great ECM label. <laughs> Well, back to some jazz, and uh, I plucked this one out of that vast sea of uh, criminally underappreciated albums, and that is a 1973 release on Atlantic from Ross on Roland Kirk called Prepare Thyself to Deal with a Miracle. And yes, indeed, it is very, very cool. Of course, much like Steve Lacey earlier, uh, Ross on Roland Kirk is uh, a fully developed, versatile artist whose you know, work is sort of um, foundationally based in tradition. And then he has the ability to out-free the freest players out there. Um, he could do anything in between, whatever, whatever he chose to do. Of course, he's the poster child for... Uh, multi-instrumentalism, uh, where he oftentimes would play three horns at once with uh, his various bells and whistles. But uh, on this release, um, I find him to be uh, at his compositionally most intriguing. Side one uh, has three cuts. 
that are in this mellow, uh, meditative, uh, very groove-laden vibes with uh, clarinet, flute, uh, nose flute. There are interactions with uh, classically-minded strings. Uh, you also have some background vocals uh, by the great Gene Lee and Dee Dee Bridgewater. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Side two, a totally different story. There is a 20 plus minute uh, non-stop circular breathing tenor saxophone tour de force <laughs> called Saxophone Concerto. And indeed it is. Um, it starts out in this, uh, this post-bop vein and uh, morphs into this uh, circus vaudeville vibe and then back to post-bop and, and then finishes uh, in this uh, John Coltrane Ascension style tornado. <laughs> it, is, it is really something. So uh, let's check out a little bit of saxophone concerto from uh, Rasan Roland Kirk and prepare thyself for a miracle. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, that's some saxophone. Um, and uh, as usual with a lot of uh, Ross and Roland Kirk recordings, uh, there are no overdubs. Um, he uh, He's just uh, going for it in his own personal layered style. But uh, I'll tell you, um, he has a, a wonderful catalog and... Uh, for me, this is one of the best amongst all of it. Uh, again, Atlantic Records from 1973 from the great Rasan Roland Kirk. Prepare thyself to deal with a miracle. Yeah. Don't lop your head and don't let your conscience get you down. Hold up your head, darling. Don't let your well, I'm certainly not getting out of here without uh, some blues, and I want to uh, talk about one of my all-time favorites, Sonny Boy Williamson. Sonny Boy Williamson number two. Yes, there were two of them. Uh, his name was Rice Miller, if you're doing any investigation. But this is a 1976 uh, Chess Records compilation. They had a great series uh, called the Chess Blues Masters series. Uh, they all had these illustrations, uh, double LPs, great liner notes, and uh, you know feature uh, a lot of the greats uh, from the Chess Records stable. And uh, in many cases, uh, this is the end-all be-all of a particular artist. You, in, in a lot of ways, you don't need to go much further. So I highly recommend this this series. So anyway, Sonny Boy Williamson, just one of the, the most um, experienced and traveled uh, blues musician in the history of the genre. He, uh, he went a lot of places. He did a lot of things and, and uh, eventually wound up again, on the, the chess roster and uh, recorded some unbelievable sides. He was a singer, songwriter, and harmonica player. And uh, what I appreciate most about Sonny Boy Williamson is his songwriting and his lyrics. Um, blues, for me, at its best, is uh, really uh, incredible poetry. I mean, you think about Robert Johnson, for instance, and you separate out uh, the lyrics from the music, and you read them straight up, and it's powerful stuff. And Sonny Boy Williamson uh, had that ability as well. A lot of his lyrics are seemingly 
uh, autobiographical and there is this um, pragmatism and philosophicalness to his lyrics uh, that are, are just, I'm just really attracted to it. Um, a lot of times uh, they're wrapped up in this kind of wryness as well. I mean, there's one song in particular um, called Don't Lose Your Eye. And it's a song that's based about, you know, playing straight, being honest. And as he says in it, in it if you're a wrongdoing person, you'll be found out. And, uh, you know, that is just basic stuff. And, and it's, I mean, it's appropriate for today, even with all the... Uh, uh, the lying and half-truths and uh, conspiracy theories that we're uh, surrounded with uh, currently. Very meaningful stuff. The other cool aspect is, um, wow, it's all delivered in this uh, mostly uh, just delicious, relaxed grooves um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, of course, he's got people like Otis Spann and Willie Dixon, you know, backing him up. And uh, it's just infectious uh, grooves. And, and his harmonica playing is is very um, economical. Um, he's not a flashy harmonica player. And vocally, he's just got this wonderful, raspy, shop-worn voice that uh, uh, it, it just tells you that what he's talking about, he's lived it and he means it. But that groove. Mm. Let's check out a little bit of uh, one of the groovier grooves on this album uh, so you get uh, a chance to understand what I'm talking about here. Baby. Yeah, you know, what a gift it is to have uh, an artist and a musician uh, who could express themselves so uh, clearly and in no uncertain terms. And, and again, that's what I just dearly, dearly love about Sonny Boy Williamson. So again, this is a 1976 chess records compilation just called sunny boy williamson from the chess blues master series ah a breath of fresh air la madrugada está ya como una estatua como una estatua de alas que se dispersan por las well speaking of cool comps have been revisiting this beauty uh, Afro-Peruvian classics, uh, The Soul of Black Peru. Uh, this was uh, released on David Byrne's uh, Luaca Bop label, uh, originally on CD in 1995, and then they uh, released it on vinyl in uh, 2014. And uh, really, really cool stuff. Um, generally... Uh, very relaxed, rhythmic material uh, with some great singers. Just very, very enticing stuff. But what's really fascinating is the backstory of uh, Afro-Peruvian music. Uh, of course, it starts with uh, the human tragedy of slavery and West Africans being uh, shipped and sold into slavery in uh, Peru in, uh, during colonial times. And much like here in the United States with blues or even jazz, um, you know, you have uh, these West Africans that are bringing some musical influence and then mixing it with uh, the culture that uh, they were shipped to. Um, and uh, that music for Afro-Peruvians uh, stayed pretty private uh, amongst themselves even after uh, slavery was abolished in Peru in uh, the 1850s. 
And then the story moves forward 100 years uh, in the 1950s where you had uh, researchers that were uh, trying to uh, bring to light and figure out uh, that old African uh, Peruvian culture. Um, at that point, mostly through uh, oral history, uh, they even examined paintings looking for clues about instrumentation in music and uh, and dances, but uh, by that time the culture had almost all disappeared and so very little was known. And so what came out of this research is uh, an incredible music that is essentially an educated guess. Um, and what they what they guessed about is uh, pretty amazing stuff. And uh, the core of it, there's three elements, um, sort of a uh, flamenco-styled acoustic guitar, kind of the Spanish influence, uh, mixed with more uh, African-type rhythms that are is, is based around uh, an instrument called the cajon. And it's a, uh, a resonant box that the uh, musician sits on top of and, uh, and, and drums on the front side, um, similar to a conga. And the third element uh, are incredible singers, beautiful voices, very emotional, evocative uh, stuff. And as, uh, as things uh, do occur, as uh, music styles evolve, they get embellished. Uh, with other instruments, but there's always this core of, uh, of stuff. And, and this album is a comp of uh, essentially uh, 1970s and some 1980s material that uh, David Byrne uh, compiled. And uh, yeah, just really, really neat stuff. So uh, let me step back so you can get uh, further flavor for uh, some Afro-Peruvian style. Lando, lando, siempre contigo y conmigo. Lando, lando, siempre yeah, neat stuff for sure. Uh, I've been enjoying this quite a bit. If you're a fan of uh, Brazilian music or Cuban music, um, this should be kind of a no-brainer for you. Uh, and this particular comp uh, is just a great way to start and a great way to dive into this uh, really, uh, yeah, special. Yep, I'll go with that. Special music. Afro-Peruvian classics. Uh, the Soul of Black Peru, uh, a comp uh, originally from 1995, but issued on vinyl in 2014 on Luacabop. <laughs> well, I want to end uh, with some jazz, some great jazz from one of the greatest jazz artists of all time, Mr. Sir Reverend John Coltrane. The reason I'm ending here is I, I, I recently had an amazing opportunity uh, to be a host at one of the uh, worldwide uh, Classic Vinyl Sundays events. Uh, here in Kansas City, there is a, a chapter of the Classic Vinyl Sundays uh, that was started in London by the DJ uh, Colleen Cosmo Murphy and has, has spread out to different chapters around the world. Kansas City has the, uh, the second largest attendance of these, uh, only second to New York City. And uh, this past month, uh, the featured album was A Love Supreme. And uh, it was an incredible three-hour event. I... I I was able to uh, do a pretty deep dive uh, into Coltrane's uh, music between 1957 and uh, culminating with uh, A Love Supreme. And 
my friend Kelson Rooks, who uh, hosts all of these, um, brings in an amazing sound system. It's a $100,000 plus sound system with audio note monoblocks, uh, clip speakers, horn speakers, which are just amazing with, with jazz, with horns. But anyway, as I said, I had an opportunity to do uh, a very deep dive into uh, Coltrane's music, both at home and then for the folks who attended. And it didn't stop there for me. Um, I, I kind of kept going, um, listening and exploring further. And uh, it it led me uh, to re-fall in love uh, with this wonderful record uh, called First Meditations for Quartet. And uh, this is a 1977 release, uh, fully evidenced uh, by the artwork of this cover. But uh, this is uh, one of those uh, Coltrane albums that uh, I think kind of gets overlooked a little bit. It's kind of fascinating. Um, after Coltrane recorded Love Supreme, you know, the very next thing he went into the studio, he recorded um, like uh, Chim Chim Cherie, you know, song from Mary Poppins trying to kind of uh, recreate uh, the success from uh, My Favorite Things. Uh, Nature Boy, a, an old classic, was recorded as well. So he actually kind of took a step backwards. Now, that was not the next album that was released. So... He does this Chim Chim Cheri and others, and then he records the uh, amazing Ascension. I mean, a complete, you know, outer space launch. Um, and then after Ascension, he recorded this material. And this is the last and final recording of John Coltrane's classic quartet. And, um, but he didn't particularly like what had happened here. And a couple months later, he went back and re-recorded some of this material uh, with the addition of uh, Rashid Ali on drums and uh, Pharaoh Sanders. And uh, that became the album Meditations. But this is the first attempt at it. And I'll tell you what, this is awesome, and, and some of the uh, material on here I like better than what's on Meditations. And so, uh, for me, this album is um, kind of the missing bookend. Uh, not a missing link, but a missing bookend. And what I mean by that is that um, Crescent, which I talked about uh, previously, was kind of like... Um, a heartfelt goodbye and, and it, uh, of, of where he had been and a turning of a page toward A Love Supreme. Brilliant, brilliant album. Then, of course, you have A Love Supreme, you know, one of the, the greatest artistic statements uh, in the history of mankind, and I, I'm, I don't say that jokingly. And then I find this recording of Meditations uh, for Quartet to be the bookend on the other side of A Love Supreme because uh, the first side of this album is right in the uh, A Love Supreme pocket. Um, you could almost hear some of this material being on that album. So let's check out just a moment and I think you'll hear a very, very uh, A Love Supreme vibe going on on the first side of uh, First Meditations. <laughs> I think that uh, should have sounded a little familiar to you if you're familiar with Love Supreme. Now the second side is another turn of the page and a, a turn of the page uh, towards heading out 
and heading towards the direction that uh, John Coltrane would play out uh, for his remaining days. Um, it doesn't get completely out uh, like he does uh, in, in some of his later sonic explorations, but it is that page turn. So for me, it is this, this beautiful uh, bookend of uh, three records that uh, I enjoy and love very deeply. So again, this is a 1977 release on ABC Impulse called First Meditations for Quartet from the always great and seemingly alive uh, John Coltrane. Well, that wraps up this uh, edition of uh, a Vinyl Orgy. And uh, again, thank you to everybody. Thank you to uh, new subscribers that have come on board. And uh, I urge you to uh, drop me a line. I, uh, I love the comments. I will engage with each and every one of you uh, and uh, will respond to everybody. And I'm really, really enjoying some of the conversations that are going on. So please keep it up. And also, please do what you can to keep it in the groove. And I'll see you next time.